السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته. نحمده ونصلي على رسول النبي الكريم. أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم. بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم. الحمد لله رب العالمين. الرحمن الرحيم. مالك يوم الدين. إياك نعبد وإياك نستعين. إحدنا السراط المستقيم. سراط الذين أنعمت عليهم غير المغضوب عليهم ولا الضالين آمين قال الله تعالى في شان حبيبي إن الله وملائكته يسلون على النبي يا أيها الذين آمنوا سلوا عليه وسلموا تسليما اللهم صل وسلم وبارك على سيدنا مولانا محمد طب القلوب ودوائها وعافية الأبدان وشفائها ونور الأبصار وديائها وعلى آله وصحبه دائما أبدا صلاة وسلاما عليك يا سيدي يا رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم Today is the 20th of Rabi al-Awwal and so inshallah we'll continue talking about the blessed birth of Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam You know, last week, you know, it kind of ended, uh, you know, I was talking about donkeys. Uh, and, you know, donkeys, everybody, you know, most people, when you think of a donkey, you think of some stupid animal. Uh, which is interesting, because when we talk about Ya'fur, you know, who was the donkey of Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, you know, this was, this was, you know, a very, very intelligent animal. And its intelligence was based on its connection with Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. You know, Nabi, by definition, is one who brings the news of the unseen. You know. So in order to bring the news of the unseen, you have to be given that news. So Rasulullah Sallallahu is the one whom Allah Subhanahu Wa has given the news of the unseen. He came and he told us about the hereafter and things that would happen in the future and also things that happened in the past because no one there knew what happened in the past. So again, for them, they were things of the unseen. And even for us, how do we know what happened in the past? We weren't there. So Rasulullah he came with all of this news. But the greatest unseen is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala himself. So he came with the news of our Lord, of the existence and the characteristics of Allah. But he not only came with that news, he came with the ability to transfer that news. That, that knowledge, you know. And not only transfer it to those things that we think of as intelligent, you know, things that can move and talk and, and stuff, but also to transfer that things to, to transfer that knowledge to those things that have no soul. You know, even to the stones. So Yafur, the donkey of Rasulullah, because of his connection with Rasulullah, whenever Rasulullah would tell him, say, go and get so and so. <coughs> He not only knew who so-and-so was, but he also knew where so-and-so was. And he went directly there, and when they would see him, they knew, Ah, the Messenger of Allah, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, is calling me, so let me go. On the morning that he was born, you know, and this is where we started, before we shifted to Yafur. On the morning that he was born, When those women who were present you know, during that blessed time of his birth, you know, who were acting as midwives for, for the mother of Rasulullah Wasallam, So when they are leaving the house, you know, they see donkeys outside hugging each other, you know, necks upon necks, and then saying, speaking, you know, that before... You know, all of the prophets told about the rights of, of, of human beings. And now the one who is going to tell about our rights has come. 
Because Rasulullah SAW is not only a rahmat of, of, of just men, he's not only a mercy to mankind, but he is a mercy to all of creation. And if you look at, you know, Islamically, you know, we can't even oppress an animal. Not even oppress a tree. You know, we are forbidden to even cut down trees just to be cutting down trees. Unless there is specific purpose and use for that. You know, when we slaughter or, or an animal, then, then it's, it's right upon us that everything of it should be used. When we have animals a burden, we can't overburden them. So these women hear these donkeys speaking and understand what they're saying. Now, Several interesting points here. One is that Rasulullah is, is born inside of the house, behind the wall. Because there is a so-called narration where, where it's claimed that Rasulullah said that I don't know what's on the other side of the wall. I haven't even been given the knowledge of what's on the other side of the wall. And there are people who try to use this and say, oh, see, Rasulullah he didn't know anything more than anybody else knows. I mean, if you, if, you, if you analyze what they're saying, they may say it in fancy words, but if you truly analyze what they're saying, that's what it means. It's, oh, he didn't know anything any, any more than anyone else. And you can't even call these people donkeys. Because even the donkeys knew that Rasulullah Sassam knows. Because even his presence gave them the knowledge of what's going on beyond, beyond the, the wall. Yeah. And personally, I don't know if the donkeys were, were speaking where the women, you know, Arabic so the women could understand, or they were speaking in their own language, but yet the women could still understand. But this is also a transfer of, no, of knowledge to those who, who were there at his birth. So, you know, again, we talk about the birth of Rasulullah so, and we talk about every aspect of Rasulullah so, and to make sure that we understand that we are not like him and he is not like us. And this is a point that I'm going to keep coming back over and over on, too. But when we look at like the description, like when Allah Subhanahu wa Taala talks about the birth of Musa alayhi salam, you know Moses peace upon him in the Quran, you know, and he talks about you know, so so you start wondering, okay, how did these people know that this prophet is about to be born, who's going to overthrow Pharaoh? How did the the uh, consultants of Pharaoh know this? And also, how did they know when he's going to be born? Okay, you know, okay, somebody's going to come and he's going to do this. But how do you know, okay, this is about the time when he's, this is the time when he's going to be born. How do you know this? Because whenever Allah subhanahu wa sent one of his, the ones he loves, he also sends signs with them. And the signs simply don't come later, they come right at the beginning. Uh, so when Musa al Islam is born, there are many signs that now they recognize, oh, this is when this boy is going to be born. When we look at the birth of Rasulullah, so some we look at all the signs Allah subhanahu wa gave to all of the world. You know, if you look at the signs, you know, at the birth of the time of Musa al Islam, they were local to Egypt. You look at the signs during the birth of Isa al Islam, they were local to, to Bayt al Laham. Bethlehem. You know, you look at the signs of various other prophets and they were local. Yet the signs for Rasulullah were global. You have two major superpowers of the time. The Roman Empire, you know, which at this time has become the Holy Roman Empire, known as the Byzantian Empire. And you have the Persian Empire. 
The Persians are fire worshippers, and within them other idol worshippers. And the Byzantians, of course, are Christians. But those Christians who have distorted their religion to where it really now is nothing to do with what Isa a.s. brought. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, when Rasulullah is born, he sends a message to everybody. Signs are sent to everyone that my beloved has come. And now that he has come, now darkness will Vanish. fade away. When light comes, darkness Vanish. vanishes. Because the definition of darkness is the absence of light. So when light comes, darkness has no other option but to go away. And when so when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sends his light in the form of Rasulullah <laughs> signs are sent everywhere. You know, and everybody, you know, we've talked about this before, and if you if you listen to any talk on the birth of Rasulullah, they will mention all of these things. <coughs> Qisra, the, Rome, the Persian emperor, 14 of, his, of the columns in one of his major palaces fell. Not 13, not 15, 14. As a sign that from the time of the birth of Rasulullah to the end of the Persian empire, there will only be 14 more Qisras. So Allah subhanahu wa is telling them, your time is coming. When the Persian emperor of the time, when he asked somebody to find out what's going on because we'll get into the other signs that came as well he was told this that there will be 14 from your time to the end of this empire the one who has been born he will he, he will come and he will uh, your, your empire will vanish in front of him because of him but there will be 14 more Kisras to come so he was happy you know he's because Kisra was Kisra for life so you have 14 more, so he's thinking, oh, you know, you know hundreds of more years. Yeah. And yet within four years, you had, you had an overthrow of 10 Kisras. <laughs> and then by the, by the, during the Khilafah of Uthman, you had the end of the, of the Persian Empire. No more Kisras. Yeah. No more Kisras. And that's it. A fire that they worshipped in Persia that had been lit for thousands of years had not gone out. And if you think of it, you know, just from a, uh, I guess from a scientific standpoint, you know, this was probably one of those oil reserves that was boiling up. You know, they'd lit on fire and now the fire doesn't go out. Constant fire. And so this was their, you know, they worshipped, this was they, what they worshipped. Yeah. Suddenly is extinguished, goes out, at the birth of Rasulullah. So, again, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is telling everybody, my beloved has come, and all falsehood now is on its way out. Within Persia, you had this major lake, freshwater lake, it was called Sawa. It was so large that you had, you had like, major ships that would sail on this, this, this lake. And this was like a pride for the Persians. Yeah. Suddenly, it goes dry. <coughs> Over on the Roman side, <coughs> they also get warnings. This light shines forth, and they realize, oh, Someone has come. The interesting thing here, though, is, you know, if you remember when Rasulullah sent the letters to the Persians and letters to the Romans, you know, the Persian emperor, Qisra, he ripped the letter of Rasulullah The Roman emperor, he honored the letter and had it placed in a, in a special box to be kept uh, safe. For the Persian emperor, Rasulullah said, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will destroy or, or 
destroy his kingdom as he has, or rip his kingdom apart as he has ripped my letter. The Byzantians, uh, Islam came into their territory and they had to withdraw, but their empire was not destroyed. Simply because he honored the letter of Rasulullah. <laughs> Otherwise, they would have also been destroyed. And many things, you know, it's kind of like, you know, you're talking and things go leave your head. Uh, you know, again, you know, various signs, not only in Persia and, and, and uh, Rome, but in Yemen and various other places. Everybody realized, you know, there's a sense that something major has happened. The jinn. You know, we talk about mankind, now let's talk about the jinn. Before the birth of Rasulullah, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, you know, the jinn were allowed to go up into the heavens. They would sit on top of each other and go up into the heavens and listen to the conversation of the angels. And what they would do would be that the top one would tell the bottom one what he heard, plus he would add a little lie into it. And then that one would hear, would listen to it, and then he'd tell the bottom one and add another lie into it. And so forth until Rasulullah said that for every one truth there were 99 lies. Then what they would do is they would have their certain people that they, that they were associated with and they would tell them to, and they would tell them that this is about to happen, because this is what they heard. Of course, there would be many lies mixed in with it. And the people, and he would go and tell the people, and the people would, they would hang on to the truth and forget about the lies and say, oh, see this man, he, he knows things. Because they forgot about all the lies he told them. The other thing that they would do is they would come and they would sit inside of the idols and they would speak from within the idols. Telling the people, oh, you know, it's like if they heard that when it's going to rain, oh, the rain's coming. Plus, of course, other lies mixed in with it. And people would, oh, this idol, you know, start worshipping the idol. When the Rasulullah system is born, all of this is stopped. It was not stopped when the revelation came, but it was stopped when the Rasulullah is born on his birth. Again, warning shots have been fired. You know, straighten up. This is your opportunity to straighten up. So what happens now is that whenever the angel, or whenever the jinn try to go and listen to the conversations of the angels, the angels throw throw burning stones at them and run them off. The ability for them to go inside of the jinn and speak, or go inside of the idols and speak, gone. So now they can't speak from there. Some of them became trapped within the idols that they, they were, like in Uzza, which was one of the major idols of, uh, of, of the pagan Arabs. And so when Rasulullah had it destroyed, he, he told Khalid Radion, you will see this, and when you see this, also kill that. And so he went and broke the idol, and he comes back, and he says, Ya Rasulullah, I didn't see anything. He says, go back. You haven't completed the job. So now when he goes back, he sees this strange figure, like a woman with long hair, and just, you know, like a witch running, making this strange noise, and he beheads it, and then he comes back, and he says, Ya Rasulullah, this is what I did. This is what I saw, and this is what I did. And Rasulullah says that with the jinn that sat inside of that idol. Again, the emphasis for all of this, you know, again, when we speak about the birth of Rasulullah is again, that we understand that we are not like him and he is not like us. His birth is not like our birth. We are born from filth. Yeah. You know, and when we're born, no one wants to even touch us until we're cleaned up. You know, you go to the 
to the hospital and everybody's gowned up and wearing gloves and, you know. And then once the baby's washed up, then people hold the baby. Rasulullah when he was born, there was no filth. He is pure. And anything that contact, you know, that he wishes to be pure and con that touches him and he wishes it to be pure becomes pure. He was born already circumcised. And he was born where the umbilical cord was already cut. There was no connection. Because again, as I said, as we spoke about after uh, Salat last week, Rasulullah is not in need of anything except for his Lord. I mean, you think about it, you know, if the umbilical cord is cut, even for a small moment within the womb, the baby dies, and even if you're able to get the baby out alive, in, you know, very quickly, you know, cerebral palsy and other major, major health issues, if the baby survives. Rasulullah the umbilical cord is already cut because it was never needed. It never needed to be connected. Because again, his sustenance is from his Lord. His connection is his Lord. His only need is his Lord. You know, we need all of these things. You know, when we're born, if there's no air, well, we, what happens? We die. If there's no food, we die. You know, if there's no milk, because we need all of these things. Rasulullah is not like us. So even his birth is not like ours. Even his passing is not like ours. You know, I was listening to a, uh, a talk from this... Uh, again, I can't even say donkey because then the donkeys on the Day of Judgment would complain. You know, you know, you've associated us with something like this. You know, you'll understand what I mean. Because what he's saying, he starts talking, you know, about, he says, oh, this is the month of Rabiul Awal, blessed month. This is the month of the birth of Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. You know, but, that, that but, this is also the month that Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam died. And he's talking in Urdu, he says, intaqal. He doesn't even have the decency to say wafat. He says, intaqal, multiple times he says this. You know. So yeah, we're happy he was born, but then we're sad that he died, so that cancels each other out. Yeah. Which is interesting, because these are the same guys who, when we, when we talk about the martyrdom of Imam Hussein al-Islam, and we cry as we're talking, this, oh, you know, you, it's, in Islam we're, we're uh, forbidden to mourn for more than three days. Literal hypocrites. Because there they say that, and then for here, oh, you know, we're sad because he passed away on this day. And they don't even say that, oh, Dad, we're sad because he died on this day. Yeah. But even when we talk about the passing of Rasulullah, so, so as I mentioned before, his passing is not like our passing. We die when it's our time to when our time has come. We have no option in that. Our time doesn't extend a moment or come before the moment. You know, Ali, Karam Allah Waj, you know, he was asked, you know, people knew his bravery, you know, he'd go into the battlefield running, you know, while everybody else is kind of planning their moves. He's running in. No armor in the back, only in the front. And just moving forward, never backing up. So people asked him, aren't you afraid of death? He says, why should I fear my greatest uh, protector? Yeah. Because death has a time, an appointed time. It doesn't come before that and not after that. So if it can't come before my time, then if something dangerous is happening to me, death itself will protect me. Why should I fear my greatest protector? Mm. 
Rasulullah sallallahu when it, when when time came Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave him the option That if you wish, you know, the message has been completed, but if you wish, you can live with them longer. And Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi says, and then what? And he says, eventually you will come back to me. And he says, let me come back to you now. My greatest friend, Allahu Rafiq al Allah is the greatest friend. Let me go back to my friend. So even his passing is not like our passing. And when we talk about his passing, we see, you know, Bibi Aisha Siddiqa, she said that, you know, they would put a towel on his head because his fever was so high that immediately a wet towel would become dry. Even that was why. Why was that? Because he himself asked Allah, he said, Oh Allah, give me the, 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 the difficulties of my ummah so that, so that death will be easier on them. I accept all of this. You know, this is the love he has for us, and we don't even remember him. Shame on us. So, you know, and, and they use this kind of so-called reasoning, you know, and somebody who has no background, suddenly he gets trapped into the, their, their talk, you know, because they'll say, oh, you know, he talked very calmly. He didn't get upset. They don't get upset because they don't believe in anything. You know, why do we become upset when people ridicule Rasulullah Because of our love for him. That's right. If we don't get upset, then you have to question that love. You know, if somebody comes and baths at, bath, ma, bad mouths me, I'm upset. Yet they say something against Rasulullah, so, so I'm, I, you know, I'm very calm. Yet we're supposed to love him more than everything else. That means my iman, I don't have any iman. Oh, you know, he talked so calmly, so nice. He didn't get upset at all. So he must be very good. And he's, he's feeding you poison, smiling at you, giving you poison, killing your iman, and it's, oh, what a nice guy. And this is the condition that we're in now. Iman is love of Allah and His Messenger. And love is not a mild emotion. Love is an extreme emotion. We have to temper our love because Rasulullah told us to temper our love with, the mercy, with His mercy. But we temper it in under certain conditions. There are other conditions where it's not it, where it becomes haram to temper that love. And when it comes to the honor of Rasulullah, it is it is haram to say that, oh, you know, I'm going to be I'm going to be uh, uh, mild in this condition. It's like I was saying, you know, this guy who is talking like this, you know. Saying, oh, you know, he, he was born on this day, but he also, uh, according to him, died on this day. You know, so, so, you know, it kind of balances out. So, you know, we shouldn't do anything. And moreover, the day he, the day he is born is blessed day. But he left his blessed, blessed day. day. And also, it is the day when his mission was completed, you know. So for us, both days are blessed ones, and they are mentioned in the Quran for Yahya and Isa He mentioned last Friday. So I'll end here today, inshallah. Uh, we'll continue from here next week, um, and I'll make the announcements after Salat, inshallah.
So may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give our, you know, fill our hearts with his true love and the true love of his beloved Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, his family, his companions, and all of those whom they love, inshallah. Those who have not made sunnah, go and make sunnah, inshallah.